we're working together to secure a long-term, sustainable, secured supply chain. Part of getting away from these rare earth metals and the volatility in pricing, that's where startups come in. That's where innovation comes in. Investments alone won't really solve the situation. So, so it's really something uh, for the investment community, for, for governments and for OEMs themselves to really be monitoring very closely. I would like to welcome you all to the one-to-one -one Global Online Tech Metals event. So joining me here today to talk about OEMs and their evolving roles in the upstream, we have George Fang, Executive Vice Chairman of Zhejiang Huayu Cobalt, Tu Li, Managing Director at Sino Auto Insights, and Enrique Ribeiro, Latin American Metals Editor at S&P Global. So um, competition to secure the, actually, you know what, before we begin that, it would be great if we could hear a short introduction from each of you. So maybe George, if you'd like to kick us off and just um, you know share share some details about your bio. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much, Amy. So for this opportunity, we kind of have a discussion with our friends. So uh, this is George Fan. Uh, we I'm working in Huayo Cobalt. Uh, as an executive vice chairman and senior vice president. So uh, my major working scope in Huayo Cobalt is uh, uh, strategic efforts and uh, legal and compliance, and also uh, um, Indonesia project construction and operations. So uh, this is the major working scope. And also for Huayo Cobalt, it's a battery material producer. So what we produce is, is a precursor and castle material uh, for uh, uh, EV batteries and also for uh, other batteries as well. Thank you. All right, thanks. And two. Hi, Amy. Uh, thanks for inviting me on this panel. Um, looking forward to learning from Enrique and George. Uh, my name is Tu Lee. I am the Managing Director at Sino Auto Insights. Uh, we're a management consultancy global now. We just opened an office in Detroit, so Detroit and Beijing. And uh, we specialize in helping mobility companies um, create innovative tech-focused uh, products and services uh, to move people and things forward. Uh, I also am the co-host of Chinese China EVs and More. It's a weekly podcast that goes over the week's most important news uh, about the global EV, AV, and mobility sectors. Uh, I'm an American that has lived in China for the last 13 and a half years um, and was going back and forth before COVID. So, um, but now. All right, and Enrique. Hi, Amy, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Enrique, I'm uh, based in Sao Paulo. I'm part of SMP Global's a pricing team on, on the PLATS division, what used to be known as PLATS, we now typically use the name of SMP Global Commodity Insights. But uh, anyways, it's the same uh, pricing service information that we always had. Um, I'm part of the global team covering battery metals pricing. Um, we're a team of several folks uh, spanning across the globe, also with colleagues in London and, and Singapore as well. And yeah, looking forward uh, to looking forward to sharing some insights and having a great discussion today. Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today. So, um, competition to secure the supply of the key battery metals is ramping up, and we are seeing a lot more OEMs and other kind of end users looking directly into mining as a way to ensure that they can maintain access to you know, these key metals like nickel and lithium and copper. So I thought we could start with the discussion uh, looking at the battery metal supply chain. So we've seen a very serious disruption in moving metals around the world over the past few years, um, especially, you know, with the COVID-19 pandemic. Do you see the situation stabilizing now or are we entering into somewhat of a new environment where metal supply is gonna become more localized 
um, and regionalized, I suppose. Um, so maybe Enrique, if you want to kick us off on that one. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I, I would say that definitely there is a push uh, to localization for um, for several reasons. Um, you have, of course, um, the CO2 emissions, uh, which can be significantly reduced when you localize those supply chains. And uh, something that we all learned uh, the hard way with the pandemic is how the logistics can, can be complicated um, and how logistics can play a key role uh, in these uh, commodities markets and industrial markets. And uh, you're mentioning the, the disruptions to, to moving metals around the world. And of course, the logistic difficulties remain. Uh, we still see maritime freight rates uh, at very high levels, still well above the historical averages, which of course is also an incentive for that localization. And that, I mean, um, that ends up um, becoming a booster for, for some policy in that direction as well. I think probably the most recent event that we had was the Inflation Reduction Act in, in the United States, which is a, a, a very big example. And that is, of course, expected uh, to have significant effects. I was, I was reading a, a report earlier this week from my colleagues uh, at another division of S&P Global, uh, and they were highlighting the significant uh, increase that is expected to happen in the U.S. energy storage uh, deployment uh, because of the Inflation Reduction Act. So I think we're definitely going in, in that direction uh, towards more localization uh, of the entire supply chain. But something that I think is very important to, to emphasize um, is that the, the, the current existing Chinese ecosystem, it doesn't only provide, let's say, the full solution already, uh, but it's also, it's, it's also up and running already. So, so I, I really don't see uh, the world doing that transition uh, towards, you know, uh, clean energy and uh, batteries, electric vehicles, let's say the whole energy transition story. I don't see the world doing that without uh, a significant support uh, from the existing Chinese ecosystem, at least, uh, at least in, in the foreseeable future despite the, the, this very strong push towards localization. Maybe Tu and George uh, could possibly have some, some comments about this, I guess, from, from the Chinese perspective, but mm -hmm. this, is, this is in a nutshell how, how I see that situation. Absolutely. Um, Tu, do you want to follow on from that? Yeah, so um, Enrique, or Enrique uh, makes some terrific points and I think uh, he, th he hit the nail on the head with the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, which the you know president, the Biden administration disguised the climate change package as a as an economic incentive package, right? So uh, I think because currently China EV Inc is what I call all these Chinese EV companies, and China Battery Inc is pretty much BYD and CATL, although Goshen or Guoxuan. Uh, which is 26% uh, owned by Volkswagen is now looking at a factory in Michigan. So what we're starting to see is these EV and AV companies or EV and battery companies begin to fan out. And as, uh, and you know, we only have a, a few minutes. So to oversimplify this, we're looking at cobalt coming from the Congo. We're looking at nickel coming out of Indonesia, lithium coming out of Australia and Chile primarily, right? And to Enrique's point, China dominates most of those uh, mining rights. And so in the short term, we're going to see a large scramble to purchase rights for these raw materials uh, from, you know, Koreans, from the Japanese battery makers. And 
the IRA really, really tightens the screws over the next several years as to where these raw materials can come from, where the battery uh, components can come from in order to receive these subsidies. And so um, we'll also see, and this is, you know, I'd love to hear from, from the panel, we'll also see a bit more clarity on how the raw materials are mined, because right now there's a big dark cloud over that because it's still dominated by China. But you better believe that once the United States begins to really build out capacity locally, that there's going to be special interest groups that want to examine, you know, how this cobalt is mined out in the Congo, right? Um, a friend of Sandwater Insights, Henry Sanderson, just wrote a book called Volt Rush, and it lifts the veil on a lot of what most people don't know is, you know, the refining process being very energy um, uh, intensive and water intensive and where these raw materials are actually coming from and how they're mined and who mines them. Mm -hmm. And so um, we're just in the beginning innings because I've spoken with people on the ground here in the United States, still trying to figure out where they fit in with the Inflation Reduction Act, because there are still small details that aren't very clear. Uh, and once we see, it, it's in, in China where there's a mature market of electric vehicles, everything has kind of fallen into place and it's more of a market competition. Uh, but in the United States and Europe, there's still investment into increasing capacity in battery, uh, battery manufacturing, battery cell manufacturing in the United State, States, we've over the last, what, 10 or 12 months seen commitments by LG, by GM, by Ford and their partners to increase capacity as well. But if you have to buy the, the lithium from a Chinese mining company or you need to refine it in China, that really doesn't help you on the subsidies and the rebates. And so that is still going to play out again, like Enrique said, over the next, you know, 36, 48 months. So. Thank you, Tilly. May I say something? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Tilly. But I have a little bit different view. So, uh, because Ch uh, Ch uh, Huayo Cobalt is a Chinese company. We are uh, uh, we're listed in Shanghai Stock Exchange. The nowadays market cap is not very high, I think. Uh, it's around uh, 120 billion RMB. Uh, but why we mention that one? That's because Huayu is the one of the significant participants in the battery metal supply chains. Even as I mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago, say Huayu is a, a precursor and cathode material producer, but Huayu is a different company with other producers. Huayu developed the battery metal resources from both original mining operations and battery recycling mm -hmm. to supply the battery metals by ourselves. For example, we produced nickel, both nickel and cobalt from Indonesia. Uh, we produced lithium uh, from Zimbabwe, Africa. And also we got some uh, exploration activity in Argentina as well. And also in DRC, we got a copper and cobalt. But nowadays, uh, the two things, one is about the battery metal supply chain. It will be, uh, the situation will be stabilizing now or not. We say the simple answer is yes and no. Why yes? That's because it's becoming supply becoming stabilizing because of uh, pricing mechanism pricing with different metals have a different pricing and uh, for example cobalt nickel um, leasing phosphate manganese they are marketing price get up some some mechanism to be an adjustment and also alternative for battery technique approaches for example lfp AFMP, NCM, NCA, NCMA, and other technique uh, approaches to be uh, developed. 
in that case, people have a different thinking, have a different mechanism, becomes more supply, uh, becoming supply uh, stabilizing. So the supply chain. So and at the same time, we got to expansion our capacity to feed, uh, to change the fundamental of a supply and uh, demand. And that's why we say yes, it's become stabilizing. But why say no? That's because the gap of the supply and demand fundamentally still there. So they need time to be stabilized. Uh, why we say a, a little bit different view nowadays, the leasing, major leasing resources nowadays from two areas. One is Australia instead of China. Second is triangle, leasing triangle is also not China. China is a, one, of a, one of the biggest end user for leasing. Thank you. I mean, I think it's, an, you, you know, you bring up this, the, the supply, the gaps between supply and demand. Um, that are expected to come. And I think that is one of the major reasons why we do see OEMs getting involved kind of within the mining um, kind of ecosystem. So they're moving a little bit more upstream. Um, I guess- And I have to, and Amy, really quickly, I have to make a quick comment. Um, and this is where the foreign legacies were kind of a, a sleep at the wheel over the last few years, right? I think, you know, the Chinese government were uh, very prudent early on and incentivized uh, companies locally in China to really, really build out those uh, supply chains. And now we see BYD and CATL, uh, the largest manufacturers of uh, LFP battery cells, right? And we see 90% of refinery capacity for lithium based in China. Now that's, you know, that, that, that capacity is going to reduce over time. And what we'll likely see because uh, the United States uh, OEMs or the U.S. OEMs aren't going to be able to get those mining rights uh, very easily. Uh, we'll probably see a lot more refineries opening up in North America. But again, refineries are, what, a three, four-year process, yeah. right? And then we get into how is the refinery going to be powered because there's great issues now. But uh, And these are the interesting things. I don't have the answers, but, um, you know, part of getting away from these rare earth metals and the volatility and pricing, that's where startups come in. That's where innovation comes in, right? So I had the pleasure last week of, of visiting uh, our next energy or one, which is a battery cell startup in Novi, Michigan, uh, very well known. Last year, they drove um, a modified model about 600 miles, 625 miles on one charge and they have a dual chemistry battery that they're working on to commercialize by 2023. So, you know, it's companies like that, Quantscape, SES with Solid State, that are trying to close that gap between supply and demand. But ultimately, um, it, it's, it's going to be challenging um, to do that. And, and I think that's going to really put pricing volatility um, in the forefront. So I'm not, you know, I'd love to hear from 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 um, George and Enrique though. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, may I, I or I just wait for your next? No, question. go ahead. Go ahead. So, so uh, one is uh, yes, uh, the is the one of, one of the biggest this battery this, uh, producer. But another guy is uh, LG Can, I think, is one of the significant battery producers as well. So, uh, yes, you're right. The, the refinery will be set up in the other countries, for example, North America and also even Europe. So that's, that's good. That's very good things. And also with time goes on, with time goes on, why we, we see the gap with the supply and the, uh, demand? But with time it goes on, you know what, the EV, the EV uh, penetration rate getting quite, quite higher than what expected before. That's why we've got a supply get a, get a slowly growth. Now with time it goes on, that just like you mentioned, three to four years. Yeah, maybe two to three years, we will catch up the supply. So that's why we will take time, take time, to uh, fit the gap at the end of the day, it will be the balance 
of course, the, how much, how quick it can be balanced depends on uh, the growth rate of EV industries. So that's uh, what I want to add a little bit. Thank you. Enrique, did you have any follow-up? Um... Yeah, uh, I, I've, um, I would just like to comment very briefly um, about what Tu mentioned uh, about the, the, the different timing uh, that is required to, to develop a conversion plant uh, compared to, to a new mining operation. And I think this is, this is a very important subject that, that he rose and, and it also leads us uh, to another topic that I that I think we we would want to to discuss either way, which which are the uh, the challenges, um, you know, uh, to scale up the supply of of battery metals, and this is definitely something that we that we see uh, very frequently in in the lithium industry. In particular, there's of course uh, a lot of investments going on in in refining capacity. Uh, but when you, when you look upstream and, and uh, how to scale up the feedstock for, for those refineries, it's it's not it's not the same story and it's not and it and it's not so easy, right? So uh, there is a mismatch uh, between um, between the refining capacity and, and the mining capabilities that are that are being built at the moment, and uh, it it's not only that I think it's not only a, a question of, of investments uh, it's also um, it's also the the, the, the the battery grade quality uh, which is not something super easy and straightforward to, to achieve so that is also a difficult you when, when you talk about battery grade lithium um, it's it's still quite a challenge even for for incumbents so the learning curves are tend to be longer than than in other materials. So, um, on on that note, I, I was just going to say that uh, investments are definitely uh, essential um, to really help the industry uh, address that supply deficit uh, that we're seeing, not only for lithium but but also for battery grade cobalt, battery grade nickel. Uh, and, and all the battery metals that are required for, for the energy transition. But investments alone won't really solve um, the situation. So, so it's really something uh, for, the, for the investment community, for, for governments and for OEMs themselves um, to really be monitoring very closely if, if the goals, uh, the decarbonization goals uh, and the EV penetration goals are really to be achieved on a timely manner. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess, I mean, looking specifically at the roles of OEMs, we see them getting a little bit more involved in the upstream. What, I suppose, what, what are the some of the trends that you're seeing here? Is it mostly offtake agreements? Is it, you know, are, are they, what types of partnerships are you seeing? And I, I guess, what role do you see for the OEMs within this industry? Um, what what do you think makes sense? I mean, you have Tesla, you know, Elon Musk coming out and saying we're going to buy all of this, you know, all of the nickel from this miner and this miner and this miner. But you know, that might not be the most realistic approach. So, just kind of wanting to hear your opinion on on what you think works in terms of these types of partnerships. Maybe George wants to kick us off. I know you guys have some some uh, partnerships yourselves. Okay. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, for this one, I think uh, use our uh, the Chinese philosophy. We we call it one density, one destiny, one life. The the whole supply value chain and it working together. For example, why are you uh, working together with uh, we got a we got a, a strategic uh, cooperation between uh, we signed a MOC with uh, Wale and Ford. Uh, we are working together. For example, Ford Wale have a nickel 
um, cobalt resources in Indonesia. It, the resources is quite huge. Ford have uh, very much capable in the EV uh, and ambitious in EV uh, industries. So, and also we working together. Uh, Why you is uh, we use our technology to develop the resources. For example, we uh, do smelter and refinery. We produce precursor and casual material to feed the battery. So in that case, we're working together to have uh, to secure a long-term sustainable secured supply chain, the health secured supply chain. All the guys working together to, win, to create win-win situation, to stabilize the supply chain. And the second, to, to create a cost competi competitiveness comparable and, and then make the healthy supply chain. The third one is we're working together has an ESG, high standard, international standard ESG, and also uh, the carbon emission. So uh, uh, for the high standard carbon emission, green renewable energy, uh, green uh, production. In that case, people, different parties in the value chain working together to, to contribute their own strengths to uh, get a stabilized and a healthy supply chain. And in that case, the industry getting better and healthy. So another example is you'll see our another uh, the strategic cooperation between Volkswagen and uh, Modeca and Xinxia and also Huayu. It's a similar philosophy. That since the value chain, the participants working together to, to have a cooperation relationship instead of uh, get something uh, on uh, some noisy together. So uh, in that case, people can be well cooperated, healthy supply chain and good industry for the future. Thank you. Do any of our panelists want to follow on from that? Yeah, so um, Go I see a few different things going on with the OEMs, right? Um, the trend in the past uh, during the ICE phase was to uh, kind of outsource everything to the suppliers. But now what we're seeing is um, a simplification of the, the actual product, right? The, the electric vehicle, there's many less parts. And so, but there's key components, chips, batteries that really, really um, drive IP and the value. And so we're seeing reverse trend of companies now wanting to become chemists or OEMs wanting to become chemists, want to become chip designers. And so that'll um, play out over the next several years. And what we're likely to see, at least initially, is these regional attempts to, okay, China for China, you, uh, you know, for the rest of the world for the U.S. perhaps, right? Because currently with the IRA, um, in order to receive the subsidies or the, the rebates, uh, the OEMs need to have uh, parts, raw materials that either come from a free trade country, uh, a partner, or uh, effectively not Russia or China. And so how they're going to get that out in the, in the next few years is going to be impossible. Okay. But it was meant to be difficult, right? Mm -hmm. What we'll likely see is the OEMs lobby try to get loopholes or carve outs until they're able to three, four years down the line, begin to increase the capacity from non, uh, non Chinese uh, suppliers. But what we're also seeing at a macro level is the Indonesian government, the Mexican government getting involved themselves. So the OEMs might actually start negotiating with the, the heads of state, right? To secure nickel, to secure um, their lithium, because uh, Genfeng, which is a Chinese lithium mining company, um, I believe the Mexican government seized um, some of the lithium mines that they tried to acquire in Mexico. So they're they're trying to nationalize that. I don't, I don't 
I don't think it's played out completely yet, but we're seeing these countries take control and saying, okay, we want to move up the value chain as well. Right. And so, and that's the most interesting part of this entire sector is that the, the, the dynamics change constantly and the, the, the two or three big things that are happen, happening over the next few years, China EV Inc., China AV Inc. is entering the U.S., right? Before the last 35 years, most foreign automakers wanted to enter China, okay? So they look, be, look, look past some of the difficult rules and regulations that the Chinese economy had for entering. Now, if, China, if the Chinese government wants the China EV companies to to do well in Europe and the United States, they'll need to play nice, right? And the battery companies as well. You could argue that a BYD who already employs US uh, employees building electric buses in Lancaster, California are already an American company, but the rest of these guys are not. So that's going to be a, a huge aspect of what's going on. And then, you know, generally speaking, nobody wants, if you're, uh, if you're an OEM, nobody wants a CATL or BYD to have 30, 40, 50% market share, because then they control pricing, regardless of raw material, um, regardless of raw material pricing. And so what we're likely to see is them also trying to nurture smaller battery cell manufacturers to play against the CATL, to play against the BYD. And so that could increase competition as well. So, so I think it's a totally make a good point. So one is uh, BRD and also uh, uh, CATL, but actually uh, uh, a Korea company, as I mentioned before, the uh, LG, LG Group. In LG Group, they are get LG Cam, LG Energy Solution, and uh, even uh, uh, LG Mining, and LG some capitals. They uh, play quite a, quite hard and very important role in the world. Uh, used, uh, used to be LG Cam, LG Group, and the sale tail, they are similar. So sometimes this guy is bigger, sometimes another guy is bigger. So another one is the uh, Japanese. Japanese uh, have uh, very good technology in the uh, NCA and also from other technology as well. So uh, at the same time, Yomiko, Basifo, uh, play a very important role, even uh, in the cancer material. Echo Pro in Korea. So we believe nowadays in the world, there is a balance. So one side, Chinese guy working very hard. Yet another side, uh, the uh, uh, Asia, other Asia countries, even European uh, countries, they are working with uh, quite efficient. I think it's the right way to the whole value chain, the whole industry need to working together for the harmony, heresy, and good future. That's, uh, uh, that's what I think. Thank you. Very good. Thanks, George. Thanks, Amy. Uh, no, I was just going to, um, to say something very briefly about um, what OEMs, uh, particularly automakers, have been doing in terms of securing their supply um, of raw materials. I think we've been seeing um, a lot of non-biting MOUs quite recently, some offtakes uh, as well. And uh, just a quick note on that, I think I, I completely understand, um, you know, where, where does it come from, the strategy, you know, the willing to, to, to um, secure supply, but reducing the risks as, as much as possible. But I just think that uh, the industry will um, inevitably need to support uh, new mining more more consistently. Uh, of course, I'm not saying that OEMs should integrate into mining and, and be responsible for, for that. Um, but it's also very clear uh, that if the investments on mining don't come adequately and timely, 
um, it's the OEM's massive investments in, in battery plants and in the modernization of their facilities to produce EVs. It's their massive investments that will be at risk. Uh, it's their investments that will be uh, with significant idled capacity due to the lack of raw materials. So uh, I don't have the answer neither, you know, about, and I'm, I'm not, you know, I think I'm not the guy to, to tell the OEMs what they should do or what they shouldn't do. But um, I just think that uh, one way or the other, um, it will be inevitable to, um, you know, to see the situation changing slightly from or 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 not so slightly uh, in the future from what we are seeing now in terms of the OEM's involvement uh, in the raw material side of the industry. Absolutely. I think, um, I mean, that that kind of uh, brings us to a nice place to start wrapping things up. I thought that we could maybe close off with a quick look at, um, it was, this was brought up earlier about kind of, um, the ESG of it all. And so uh, placing more care into kind of how the, the raw materials are being mined, um, where all of the ESG factors that are going into it. And I guess I was wondering, does working with OEMs and perhaps having more um, of a global kind of eyes on mining, is it help, you know, is, is it strengthening the ESG standards within the industry, which could be a good thing. <sighs> I'm happy to start uh, and and we'll see how it goes. But uh, we've, I mean, we've done uh, uh, a report on ESG um, on the battery metals industry recently, uh, uh, a couple of months ago. So uh, I've been talking to a, to a lot of people about this and I, I would say that my takeaways uh, from, from, from that research and that report and, and all the conversations I had, uh, the takeaways were that uh, one, um, the scrutiny on, on battery metals tend to be higher than, than in other metals, probably because, um, probably because they serve to kind of an ESG purpose, right? But when, when you think about uh, battery metals role in the energy storage, I'm sorry, in the energy transition story, um, people will naturally have uh, higher expectations when it comes to battery metals, which I actually think is a good thing uh, because you can um, develop this industry at very high standards from, from the very beginning. Uh, of course, there is already established industry, but um, but it's just a fraction of what is expected, uh, or for in terms of size um, by the end of the decade, for example. But something that also came up uh, during that research is that despite the very strong scrutiny, uh, battery metals in general they tend to um, to actually perform very well compared to. To, to other metals when it comes to ESG credentials, uh, particularly when it comes to lithium. Cobalt has been improving significantly as well, despite all the um, human rights challenges that of course still exist around the, the cobalt industry. And uh, a, a third takeaway that was, um, that was quite actually surprising for me was that um, actually despite uh, the strong interest for ESG, uh, there is still uh, a lack of some clear directions or clear regulations. Something like, you know, uh, what are the what are the ESG rules or what is the real ESG criteria? What is the ESG requirement uh, for sustainable mining? For you know, for a mining operation to be really ESG compliant, there are. Uh, many different uh, guidelines. Um, uh, so OEMs tend to rely on documents from the OECD uh, or from the United Nations or from different bodies, but there isn't a standardized set of rules or set of requirements 
to guide the mining industry towards, uh, okay, I need to do this and this and that in order to be ESG compliant. So this is something that definitely uh, should be addressed in order to, um, you know, to, to, to potentialize the efforts that are already being done by the industry in order to really achieve uh, the metrics or, you know, the, 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 the standards that everybody wants um, from, from the mining industry and of course from, from, the EHE, from the EV whole ecosystem. Thank you. I have another three point for your question, uh, Amy. Mm -hmm. First point is uh, uh, the joint efforts from OEM together with uh, uh, mining uh, uh, produce a bad, uh, material, bad material producer company. That's that joint efforts, of course, it will be uh, good for the uh, strengthen of the ESG uh, uh, situation. That's number one. Uh, my second point is uh, the nature of the industry we're working at. Uh, is, well, that's because we're working in the new energy industry. So uh, Huayu is a precursor and cancer material producer. So in that case, we try to make a, our own contribution to the energy revolution. In that case, whatever we do will be a top priority is higher than ESG and also uh, carbon emission reduction and also a carbon neutralization. So with or without OCM working together, we will towards the same direction. The third point is even uh, I'm not working in this industry, before I've joined Huayu, I'm working in Gigi Mining. Uh, Gigi Mining is a gold and copper producer, but we are still doing green mining operations. So for mining industry, for mining operations nowadays in China, we're talking about a lot about ESG, even uh, whether we are in the new energy industry or not. Thank you. All right, thank you. And two, uh, your kind of closing closing thoughts on this. So I think now that we're starting to see electric vehicles become a global phenomenon, uh, it's still the, so 2022, we're probably looking at uh, 10, 10 and a half million NEV sold. So if we include uh, plug-in hybrids, uh, globally, there'll probably be about 10 and a half million vehicles sold. China's going to still dominate with six and a half million of those 10 and a half. Uh, the United States is gaining a little bit on Europe, but uh, Europe is actually doing really well because of the aggressive targets that they have for carbon reduction. And um, what... I'm hoping to see at least uh, now that it's become global is that these publicly traded companies, um, their feet get held to the fire, right? Uh, because I mean, ESG has become part of uh, uh, publicly traded companies' KPIs, right? And what there isn't is a ton of visibility on the mining uh, across these countries that uh, we don't know very much about. And so we have an opportunity to get in front of this before global demand hits 20, 30, 40 million units. And uh, it's going to be much more difficult to stop that train. Uh, wh what I don't want to see is another diesel gate, right? Where a company says that they're in compliance with X, Y, and Z, and they end up not being. Uh, and, and I think this is a huge opportunity to create visibility uh, and standardization across the world when it comes to uh, a, what, what a European OEM um, considers ESG and US OEM, a French OEM, uh, you know, uh, a UK OEM uh, considers um, being in compliance with e ESG standards, you know. Um, it, it's gonna be a slow, 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 slow trickle until it, Till it's not. And I think we probably have five years before EV demand globally hits that tipping point. And ICEs, the, the sale of ICEs really start to drop off a cliff. So um, that's, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, you make a really good point about, you know, starting off on the right foot um, as, as the industry really starts to ramp up. Um, so 
with that, I think um, that that's a really good place for us to end up. I want to thank all of our panelists for joining us today um, for this session. It was quite enlightening and interesting to hear everyone's thoughts on kind of the role of OEMs uh, within the industry. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Amy, thank you for uh, thank you. inviting us. Enrique, George, uh, my yeah. pleasure speaking with you. Yeah, thank you, Julie. Thank you. Yes, very good. Thanks for the great conversation.